welcome everyone. Um, good afternoon and um, thanks for joining. This is a 60 minute webinar that's part of our Reinventing the New Shape of Work series, uh, which has been focused on deep diving into the most relevant workplace topics. And as of course, we're going to talk about COVID and the impact um, it has on our employee experience at the moment. Um, but fundamentally, we're hoping to bring forward some insights that you can go away with to really help shape and define um, the experiences that they're being exposed to today. Before we kick off, it's important we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting today and would like to pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, before we launch, um, also some more housekeeping. Um, so we have a Q&A function to answer any questions, um, which we'll do towards the back end of the, the chat. But also we have a chat function for any thoughts and insights along the way. And if you could include all panelists and attendees before sharing, that would be great. Okay. And also thank you for all those who have submitted questions ahead of time. We have made an effort to try and embed some of the responses. And we have to some extent built our um, session today around those. So you get the best of um, what you're expecting from this one hour. Um, when I go and introduce who I have with me today, you'll, you'll very much understand why keeping it to an hour will be quite the challenge for us. Um, so here we are um, coming into the sixth month of our COVID experience. March 2020 was certainly the beginning of the world's largest human experiment, creating disruption and uncertainty for all at numerous levels beyond just the organisation and individual. I mean, that's probably the understatement of the year. The experiment is still ongoing, conditions changing constantly, and results currently unknown. However, what we do know is that we're all going through it together. Some quite differently, some thriving, finding silver linings, while others are really struggling and finding new ways to try and stay survival, in survival mode. But what we also know is that employers have an opportunity when it comes to employee experience, and we are all going through it. So it's, it's an opportunity for leaders and organisations to actually be part of that as a proactive move to make a difference. So whether you like it or not, the employees are genuinely experiencing something. So as a strategy, we also have an opportunity to make this a positive defining moment for them. If you like to think of it as it's a strategy in seeing the world through their eyes, but also crafting a solution that will work for them, not, not a top-down solution, which what we're more used to. So joining in me today in this discussion are my esteemed colleagues who I work with uh, quite frequently in this field. Firstly, I have Kashmira Darawala. Hi, Kash. Kash is a registered psychologist from our Melbourne careers practice and has extensive experience in leadership, org design, strategic workforce planning performance. And with survival on top of mind, Kash enjoys seeing organisations giving themselves the licence to think operate and act differently. Secondly, we have Lewis Gorard, and Lewis joins us from our international practice based in Singapore. Hi Lewis, thanks for taking time out of your day to join us. Um, Lewis loves combining psychology with data insights to drive strategic initiatives. And as a chartered psychologist and voted um, amongst the top 101 global employee engagement influencers, Lewis has published a range of thought-provoking articles on engagement, motivation, meaningful workplaces. I'm glad you uh, weren't frozen for all of that, um, <laughs> all of that time, Lewis. Um, and finally, myself, uh, the final member of the panel, I bring insights drawn from 15 years in human resources um, before pursuing a psychology career with roles based in London, Singapore and Australia. Currently based in our Melbourne careers practice, I specialise in leadership coaching, design thinking, employee engagement experience, and I love helping leaders build personal resilience through empathy. So welcome. Thanks, Mary. Um, a good place to start would actually be, before we launch into a, our discussion, is I would love to get a sense from everyone who's joined 
um, you know, what their level of familiarity with um, employee experience is. So before we go any further, you'll see a poll pop up. So if you can select one of the um, options that best work for you, then it'll be great for us to get a sense of who's on the call. When was the first time you heard about it, May? Good question. It wasn't even that long ago, I have to admit. Because um, as you know, it comes from employee engagement and you and I have similar backgrounds in that we're very much, um, you know, trained in engagement. So experience really only came about when it was far more around the continuous listening. And certainly now I understand it's more around sustainable performance. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I'd be curious to see what we get learned from the poll, but uh, yeah, I think it's been something that's been emerging for a few years now and sort of mm. making its way into mainstream practice. Yeah, I think with your perspective um, from Singapore, do, did you see um, an emergence in line with other countries or what were your thoughts? Well, I mean, you know, uh, Singapore tends to be uh, that sort of interesting mix between very advanced in some areas and quite conservative in others. I mean, mm. as a country, it favours rapid incremental progress rather than complete revolution, right, or disruption. Uh, it's a small economy it has to manage that way. So, you know, you get, there are some advantages to being that way, but, you know, a good fortune to work across a much larger uh, geographic remit, um, the domestic market in Singapore is not so large. And there, I think it's interesting to see which kind of sorts of organisations were adopting employee experience concepts first and then, you know, which ones um, perhaps are still sort of on their journey to kind of start mm. to embed them. And, and, we, and I think that's one of the things we should talk about, you know, what, what have been the accelerators of the adoption of these ideas? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I see based on our poll that we're really around the middle in terms of most are comfortable and working with it. So in fact, that sort of helps shape some of what we'll talk about. I think we <laughs> don't, of course, we're talking about now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Live. <laughs> Live. Right, so good. I love that. Yeah. Home, life, work. Okay. Um, I'm just going to have to talk through it because there's no one else up here at the moment. <laughs> That's me. So with that in mind, I think we, we should launch into... Um, their definition, because that certainly helps, you know, set the scene and also a bit on the emergence of uh, the actual concept itself, which adds, you know, to your point, Lewis, where did it actually come from and how did, how was it born out from engagement? And it's interesting as well, because from the poll, a lot of people having experience with EX, that's certainly not uncommon with what we see in the Australian market, especially when we look at a lot of Mercer's global research, a lot yeah. of what specific in the Australian region is quite advanced or mature in terms of the way that HR thinks in Australia. So it's good to see. That's a really good point. There's always that difference in terms of readiness and maturity and really driven by human resources. And I saw that difference having worked both in Australia and in Singapore, which sort of speaks to what um, organisations with multi-geographical concerns would have to think about. And it really speaks to this overall topic in that it's absolutely not one size fits all. It's absolutely to do with the people, personas, the individuals. Um, but as we go through, you know, we have some strategies around how that comes to life. Mm -hmm. And Paris, could we have the first slide, please? Thanks. So some of what we'll talk about actually is drawn from um, the context setting, which, which actually we draw the data from the Global Talent Trends Report. So this is available for you to download um, and a link will be provided. But really, we're not going to necessarily focus on that, but it does set the scene around, there was certainly a drive towards understanding that there's a gap between what the employees are looking for now in terms of um, what they expect their employ employment to provide versus in the past. So it's all about now the intrinsic experience and the motivators 
and what the employment environment can actually deliver on that. So you see, even from an ex executive point of view, one in two are absolutely um, recognizing that a consumer grade or a user experience perspective is what's required. And then the reality is that only 4% believe that they could actually deliver that. So the gap was already there even before COVID. Uh, so it's very much around, well, actually nothing's, nothing's changed. If anything, it's accelerated. The factors around this total dependency on the digital transformation, all of that was predicted. But now it's, if anything, it's really fast tracked the need to actually move in time to get better at delivering on those things that people used to think we'd have more time to plan, but now certainly we don't. So in terms of understanding, um, you know, having a baseline, if you like, of employee experience, because I could imagine it's, it's very different depending on the organisation, um, the industry, the readiness. So it, it might help us just to establish a bit of a common ground for our discussion. Uh, at Mercer, we actually view it as the intersection of the expectations of the employees. And when we say expectations, it's drawn from the environment, the individual's driver's needs, and then the events, whether it's career events, life events. But really what we're doing is we're playing up the why in the individual. We're recognizing the person rather than, you know, the person that actually sits behind the the, you know, the, the worker, if you like. No longer is it the worker or the contributor, which that, you know, was viewed in the past. It's actually about honing in on the purpose of the individual and what they want to bring to the um, employment relationship. So it looks really different across different organisations. Um, Cash, you know, in your experience, what are you seeing in the market in terms of how this might play out in different organisations? Yeah, it's really interesting. I feel like early on, employee experience was really focused around engagement, as we mentioned earlier. And I know Lewis will talk a little bit about that. There was a question that came through about what's the difference between EX and engagement, and we'll unpack that in a little bit. And then we kind of saw this shift happen towards this employee value proposition and how, you know, you need to have your hygiene factors like your REM and your BEN, and then you need to create an experience. So career pathways, learning and development opportunities, and at the top of the pyramid of employee experience, you have this connection to purpose. And, you know, a lot of organisations were kind of playing in that space, and it's now it's almost like we've taken it another step further or there's been another evolution of that to this employee experience, which really hones in on how you need to craft an experience to get employees to think and feel in a way that the organisation wants them to think and feel. How do you thrive before they even become an employee of the organisation and well after they leave the organisation? And to your point, mate, about it being really honed in on who that person is, acknowledging that people are all different. What they want, what they don't want from their employer is very different. Mm. So to see a lot of clients tapping into what the different personas are within their organisation. So extending far beyond just looking at demographics like age or gender. So mm. it's extending much more beyond, you know, women want X and men want Y or people who yeah. generally want X. It's going much more beyond that to look at who are these types of people we have in our organisation and how can we craft an experience across the entire employee life cycle to get them to thrive in the way that we yeah. want to. I think you raise a really great point. Um, certainly one that I've heard before. It's well, if we're already collecting the data, particularly through an engagement survey, like the demographic data that you suggested, and in some ways you can craft personas from that, then they're reluctant to take on, um, you know, a broader strategy like an employee experience. So I think, Lewis, you know, given your, your deep history with engagement, what would you see as some of those key differentiators between engagement and employee experience? Yeah, thanks, May. Um, I mean, so the way that I often introduce uh, employee experience is um, to try and sort of explain, you know, where it perhaps it emerged from. 
you know, as I said earlier, the, the sort of early adopters of these concepts really borrowed a lot of thinking from the sort of engineering space. So, you know, if you think about user experience, you know, mm. and thinking about, uh, you know, what, what many engineers are trying to achieve when they build tools and products for customers, a lot of the work around customer experience is really around sort of thinking about, well, so what gets a customer really engaged mm. and, you know, and uh, uh, enjoying to use the product that I have, uh, that I have designed for them. And it's many of those concepts now that are starting to move into the people space, into the HR space, um, that are that is generating, I think, uh, a lot of new thinking, and that is it's much more holistic, I think, uh, mm. and much more, more helpful uh, than um, you know where we have come from. It's not that employee engagement work is not useful; it's just evolving, I think, in a, in a useful way. So, you know, as you said earlier, you know, the the three intersection uh, inter interlinking components: uh, expectations, uh, ex uh, environment, and events come together to generate. An experience for somebody and we can think of um, the outcome one of the main outcomes of an effective employee experience as engagement but I think also the important thing is that you know it, it, it's much broader than that so if you think again using some concepts from user experience so sometimes I say that employee experience is the user experience of your company think of employees as users of the organization as a system what is going, what, you know, what generates the kind of experience that makes people go, wow, this is amazing. And the answer is, you know, not just highly engaging uh, culture, but also very productive tools. You know, one of the, uh, I think if we look at the research, one of the things that we've learned a lot from researching people at work for the last 100 years is that the opportunity to make progress every day, to feel that you're moving forward is incredibly motivating, to feel mm. that, wow, you know, this, this is an organization that's actually helping me do my job well, rather than I'm fighting with it to get my job done. And when you're sort of starting to think about, well, so what would it take for us to build an organization where people join and say, you know, it, 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 I feel like I can be a real success here, you're starting really to focus on those and get those experience concepts. I think the other thing which you mentioned in the introduction is a change in thinking from engagement, which is, you know, um, do you employee love yeah. me company? I yeah. ask you, are you proud of us? Are you, you know, you motivated to help us company succeed? And so, yes. and whereas ex the employee experience now turns the lens a little bit and says, well, how are we company helping you be a success within our environment mm. and creates much more connection there. I think the last important thing is um, the shift to, uh, towards, you know, the adoption of just a wider number of technology tools, digital working. And that gives us a lot more opportunity to get insight into people's experiences. So perhaps the shift from it to from experience and engagement to experience is also partly driven by the fact that we now have much more data and a better understanding about the day to day of people's lives at work. And that gives us an opportunity to you know, build more levers into our people processes to influence those outcomes. So think of experience yes. and input engagement as, as an outcome, <laughs> but you know, obviously a much more holistic set of ideas, I think, within the employee experience space. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I you know, often have these debates where people are ready to either completely disregard engagement as a relevant measure anymore because they feel it's perhaps had its time but I'm still a firm believer that it's a relevant metric and a lot of organizations are quite married to it as a KPI of sorts and I also believe that it's not the only indicator that you should rely on anymore and going to your point Lewis it's absolutely about that more human-centered design thinking approach where it's you know, multifaceted and it's always iterative, always going back to the employee. And it, that is quite a big shift. And as we go through today, it will, um, you'll, you know, everyone will hear more around this employee driven solution versus top down. I mean, we say that quite simply, but we're talking about generations and years of top down solution problem identified, let's fix, you know, very linear, whereas design thinking is all about this, you know, double loop learning and this constant iteration. So that mind shift 
um, actually will take quite a lot to embed. Um, yeah, and you know, May, I think the, the other interesting thing is if you just think about the disproportion that what the science says, you know, I'm, um, re, you know, to pay a lot of attention to peer reviewed um, scientific mm. articles in the social sciences. And you can see that people, the, the science suggests that people disproportionately value experiences. They make a bigger impact on your life, which is important because, you know, you might love something. And, uh, you know, if you think of a vacation, you can go to an amazing building. And, you know, if I would ask you about it and say, yeah, it was amazing. But what defines it is the experience of using that, uh, you know, the, let's say the, the hotel, you know, how, what was it actually like to be there? Was the service good? It's about that total experience. And that's much more sophisticated view. And I think also because now we've so much, um, and we can talk about this, um, more enabled to be able to gather insights about experiences close to when they're happening, mm. you can do a much better job at, man at managing them. And so, you know, for example, again, drawing from the customer science, um, if you ask someone about their vacation in the middle of it versus two weeks after it, they always view it much more positively after. Uh, or because they, you know, you, you uh, in hindsight, uh, mm. want to tell yourself you had a fantastic vacation. And I think yeah. we can all imagine when we do employee surveys, we're often asking about you know, how has this been for you, your mm. goal setting, your relationship with your boss. And we all very much understand that actually a big, we, we want to tell ourselves a positive message. Mm. We want to say, I am having a good time at work. And so, you know, sometimes perhaps we get slightly more generous feedback than we deserve. So I think this whole shift enables us also to be a lot more realistic. Yeah, I think it's funny you mentioned the, um, the analogy with the, the holiday because, Cash, you've heard me say this with a client recently. Um, they were sort of uh, wanting more clarification between the difference of an EVP and employee experience. So I described EVP as the description of the hotel by the hotel, from the hotel on their website. So it's all the highlights, the features, all the upsell. But the advisors uh, or the trip advisor is what you read, which is the experience piece. And the two together actually is combined, then giving you insight into whether that's what you want to participate in. So yeah. again, in, in summary of this, EVP engagement are all very relevant components within a broader umbrella and strategy of employee experience. Yeah. And it's interesting because the employee experience, because a part of it in that three circle thing that you saw was the individual's perspective as to what they bring to something, it really highlights the importance of having something that from anyone's perspective, they see it as positive. And so then also, again, to that not having a top-down approach, because how do you cater for everyone if it's a top-down approach? But to Lewis and May's point, putting the tools and systems in place so that people can tap into what they want to tap into so they can craft their own experience. Perfect. I think building on that, um, you know, some of the questions that came in uh, before the session really wanted to unpack, you know, with all of our current work environments, um, really forcing us to get very dependent and technology enabled. Um, you know, how is it that we can still show our ability to connect and create that sense of belonging? For example, um, with the research, so again, pre-COVID, but it was still very anticipatory in terms of to, to build thriving environments, um, Australians actually prioritised um, factors relating to feeling a sense of belonging and a sense of connectivity when they were seeking a thriving environment. So I'd say that would be sort of supercharged now, given we're, we're all in our homes. Um, you know, what are your thoughts around how you can create that sense of connectivity? Cash, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's so interesting because I feel we have mentioned a couple of times already the importance that empathy has to play and especially empathy from a people manager and a people manager that you don't see now because we're in this fully virtual environment. So having leaders who have a real ability to empathise with the employee's situation and then provide the accompanying flexibility to allow them to connect 
as much as they want to connect. Because I'm sure a lot of um, potentially introverts are loving the environment right now, you know, not having to connect as much as they may have had to being in an office in a face-to-face -face environment. So interestingly, I think the number one thing is empathy. And mm. I think people managers having high points of contact at kind of the top end to set expectation, allow employees the flexibility to do work how they want, when they want, however they need to, to manage life. And then putting in that um, touch point and con connectivity again at the back end to hold people to account. So people don't feel like they can just get away with whatever they want. The organization actually values my input and will follow up my input if it's not there. So I think in sometimes people think, oh, in terms of not holding people to account, you're giving them a lot of flexibility and letting them connect. But I think sometimes providing that structure and those boundaries are actually really helpful to foster connectivity. I think you're absolutely right. In terms of um, empathy and emotional intelligence, they're, they're certainly the top skills we're seeing as really critical for leaders during this time or any time where you need to manage crisis or you know build adaptability in your approach. Um, I think the, uh, the, the challenge is empathy isn't something you buy off a shelf or read from a book. So it really delves into if the leader pre-COVID wasn't particularly that person oriented or uh, empathetic, then where, you know, how do we then support to help them build out those, those skills? Um, Lewis, what, what's your thought on that? Well, so yeah, I mean, um, I, I had two reactions to, to what you, you and uh, Cash just shared. So, the first is that, um, you know, in many ways, I think this shift can be very positive for people from all backgrounds and with all personality types, because increasingly we will have to be evaluated based on our contribution rather than our ability to show up and gr grab attention in the office. So, you know, the shift to, to, to what's been very interesting about COVID-19 is it's leveled the playing field for many of us in terms of uh, how we get ahead and how we're evaluated. Your boss can't evaluate you based on what they see you doing in the office or, you know, how often you have coffee with them. They must evaluate with you based on what you're able to actually do. And I think that is a, a positive shift, um, you know, and I think we can learn a lot from that because, you know, most organizations in many ways are powered by nepotism and politics. You know, who are you, who do you have relationships with? I'm not saying those things are unimportant, but you know, if the question comes up about introverts, you know, how does this kind of affect them or not? You know, I would say that, well, actually we have to be a, perhaps much more objective about how we evaluate people. So I think that's a positive thing. The second thing, uh, reaction uh, that, I, uh, that, that I was kind of thinking of is, you know, when, when it comes to, to leadership and accountability is that this whole shift, again, you know, all of us making it at the same time has heightened, I think, the importance of these soft skills or, you know, actually um, here in Singapore, we're working with the government and we've just released some stuff today. What we're, call we're calling them critical core skills. So these are skills that are fungible and transferable. And, you know, those are the sorts of skills that perhaps we have uh, underestimated in terms of value, you know, uh, you know vis-a-vis -vis technical skills, mm. but increasingly become important in the current environment and perhaps in the future. Example, uh, self-management and adaptability. You know, right now, you're not getting up, going to an office, sitting down in an office, mm. working for eight to 10 hours and going home again. Your day is entirely up to you and driven by you. And there's no one hanging around supervising you directly. You feel much less social pressure. You know, you can connect with anyone at any time. This is what technology does. It resolves boundaries for individuals and for leaders. And, I, and to your point, I think it matters more for leaders because almost by definition, their job is to create a high-performing team. I mean, if that's mm. not your job as a leader, I don't know what it is. And so, you know, you're in connecting with other people trying to coordinate that group. It becomes much more difficult to do that if you can't chuck everyone in a room in the morning and say, this is what we'll do. You do this, you do that. So you have to be much more disciplined. Mm. So I think, you know, these, the, it's heightening for me um, the importance of those skills, the softer skills, adapt, like a, um, 
adaptability, interacting with others, being able to think more broadly and critical mm. sense making is one of them, um, both for individual contributors and for, for leaders, and perhaps even highlighting how, how lacking we are in many cases. In Definitely. Cases. I think, I mean, that was another very clear finding um, in terms of the, from the research around moving forward, uh, what are the skills of the future and adaptability and, um, you know, being able to work with agility was certainly highlighted. And, you know, as a leadership coach, we actually, you know, I do see a lot of that and helping people from a subject matter expert perspective shift away from that to, to gain more confidence in empathy. Um, in terms of being able to work with them in this environment, it, it actually heightens the importance of their need to do that. Um, because what we're seeing is um, senior leaders are very good at communicating and setting the scene, as you said, Cash, but then they leave a lot and perhaps too much to the middle and other levels to then reach out and actually develop and build the relationships to make sure everyone else below them is okay. So there really is this missing gap and we may, you know, uh, talk about those continuous listening tools later on. Um, but I see now we have another poll um, leading into the next question around, do you think uh, virtual working is productive? I mean, that's, that's quite a, um, an interesting one to ask. Yeah, I mean, uh, interrupted by your dog in the middle of a webinar, gets, you know, what do you do? <laughs> oh, look at that. Exactly. Well, great. Okay, we have a whole, we, we are all believers on this call. That, <laughs> uh, we will, some of us are still not sure and, and some are absolutely no. And this is probably, you know, reflective of, of the reality. If we take that as an interesting sample of what's, what's out there, um, you know, we are seeing hybrids of, um, you know, fully virtual working places and some versus office and then, and then ones in between. So really it's about, you know, challenging those um, existing stereotypes. So is it safe to say then uh, the existing stigmas around um, productivity, are they completely gone? I mean, Lewis, I know you have some thoughts on productivity and oh, well, yeah. <laughs> let's start <laughs> so, with you. I think it, the nature of the job role matters a lot, frankly. Um, I mean, I, I think that I think this has proved that yes, uh, virtual working can be extremely productive. I think there are some preferences, you know, the, that um, when it becomes possible again, to some extent, to be able to reintegrate people into larger groups in physical spaces, we will see a trend towards, you know, more thoughtful segmentation of what work should happen where. Um, and to what extent do you need to have a person get up and go to a physical place to basically work alone? And, you know, the data, I think, shows that most people, as we've seen on this call, do feel productive at home, unless they're in a position in which they are asked to manage lots of people, in which case interactions are basically the majority of what they're doing. And those people um, can feel somewhat frustrated about the, you know, the ability for, for them to you know, manage those interactions uh, as, as well as they would like. So as I said, I think that requires a slightly different set of skills. We do know that many large, particularly technology organizations have um, already stated that mm. um, be their new normal. Although I did notice that, for example, you know, one of the world's biggest technology firms, Facebook, had claimed that, yes, we're all working from home now. And then, you know, shortly after acquired a, like a 700 thousand square foot piece of real estate in New York City. So it's like, well, why do you need that then? And so, I don't, you know, I'm sure they have all sorts of creative ideas about what to do with it. But the point is, is that I don't think anyone is entirely sold in the idea that we will never see each other again. Mm. Um, but, you know, what, what is the most productive way to do certain types of work, I think will become um, an important question now for everyone. Mm. So, it's a, very, it's a very interesting time. And um, as I said earlier, because now <coughs> we are all using so much more technology and, you know, there's this shift, we also then find that um, managers are able to get more data about the kind of experiences that people are having at work. You know, technology not just doesn't just have the benefits of being functional. It also 
codifies many aspects of our behavior. And so, you know, I, there, there is therefore an opportunity, I think, for us to create cultures which are a bit more data driven in terms of the quality and consistency of people management. The, 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 there was a, is one big caveat here, which is that, of course, the risk is to um, go too far with this and we return to basically Taylorism and scientific management. And there are now, right now, I saw some videos about technologies where, you know, it will track and send a screenshot of, from your computer to your boss every 10 minutes or something so that someone knows exactly what you're doing. And, you know, that to me um, is, is sort of taking it too far because, you know... If yeah, I did see that as well. I think that's the other extreme. But as with these um, new... Uh, solutions there will always be ones that are the um, you know the anti versions of what you were trying to um, approach you know now we've opened Pandora's box to um, you know open room virtual working and making it a success I mean whilst it was forced on all of us um, you know we're, we're all seeing you know wonderful headway in terms of the innovation and technology advancement that's occurring at lightning speed, you know, far more than we would have had we not had this need to have to change more from a survival point of view. Um, but one big question relating to this is really around pro probably the, the reality of the integration with the work-life balance. Um, you know, my dog barking, that's just a daily thing now, she's snoring. So, <laughs> um, you know, Cash, I know you have, you know, that's a personal area of interest for you. What are your thoughts around um, perhaps if you are a leader and, and wanting to give advice around how to help your work virtual team, you know, maintain a healthy balance? Yeah, so when we, you know, everyone first went into COVID, definitely a lot of clients were experiencing a drop in productivity because, of course, you're trying to get all of your systems on board. You're trying to figure out new ways of work. What are our norms? What are our practices? How often should we connect with our team? How often is too much? Let's do Zoom free Fridays and all these different sorts of things and storming to figure out what works. And I feel now we've been doing it for quite a while. Productivity has now started to pick back up because we're in a routine we know what this looks mm. like or what to expect every day and I think the um, I think where we've seen productivity level out quicker is probably where people feel comfortable or have found a way to get work-life integration. So we know people are working longer hours in a virtual environment. When everyone was going into the office still, if you ever had a day a week where you worked from home, you'd always talk about how much longer you work on that day. Mm. Office is right there. And so there's not that physical break between your workplace and your home place. And so the notion of work-life balance has really been challenged. And I think the way to succeed through that, and even for leaders in what they can foster for employees, is it's no longer about this tug of war between work and life. It's about how you integrate the two of them yeah. and the work place work for your family and your personal life. And how do you make your personal life work for the work that you need to get done? And if anyone can then find the right way to get that integration happening, I think that's much more effective than trying to pursue work-life balance in the more traditional way that we have been. Mm, I really like that uh, view of the integration because that that's all very consistent with that whole person approach. And if this is a mode we're going to adopt more permanently, then it is around our personal ability to incorporate it as an ongoing strategy. Yeah. Uh, it also brings up, you know, the fact that if we are completely virtual in some organisations, uh, the challenges around bringing on new starters, um, you know, if we think back to what the physical office gives us and the physical interaction, you know, really helps build out, you know, acceptable norms, um, what's, you know, how work gets done around here, a lot of observed behaviours. Um, you know, Lewis, what's your thought on, you know, how new starters can actually, you know, be brought into the fold, if you like, and the leaders can actually help uh, create a sense of belonging, you know, even before they've started? Yeah, I mean, so I, I do think that a lot of employee experience programs have actually started with the onboarding process because, um, 
why? Well, first of all, it's a discrete group of people. You can mm. point to them. They bring no prior expectation about what the organization does. Um, it's a very, very critical time in an employee's journey. You know, you join an organization. It's a, a very emotional situation. Why? Because you're nervous. Uh, will, will my colleagues like me? Does my boss think I'm doing a good job? How do I meet, meet new people? Where am I going? You know, all of those things, you're creating a lot of uh, firsts for the person. And so those things leave a, um, a, a real mark. And frankly, you know, based on the data we've gathered, many organizations do it really badly. So it's important done badly. And, you know, uh, you can manage it specifically through, you know, there is a process that you can use in order to be able to both deliver and improve. So it's a good place to start. I think many organizations are thinking now sort of end to end from candidacy through to, you know, the end of the first year and thinking about how they can enable that with both social contact and technology. So, you know, how are we bringing our culture to life, but also making that journey as intuitive and easy as possible. The two real big, in my view, tenets of employee experience are interactions, right, with other people uh, and, you know, efficient use of very engaging and easy to use technology. So, you know, delivering you the right messages at the right time. Um, so, you know, that we're seeing organizations really starting now, you know, uh, when they, when someone accepts a job offer, they might give them an app to use, it onboards them, here are the key things we need you to know. It's a process in which, um, you know, you, you're not overwhelming the person, you're giving them those fragments of information they need to get socialized. Mm -hmm. For example, one of the big mistakes I often see organization make, organizations make is they sit the, per, the new person down on the first day and say, here are, our, here are the rules, here are our values, here is our this, you know, and you, they start really big. Mm. And, that, and so it's like, that sounds nice, but the person is still trying to figure out where the toilet is. Like, you know, it's <laughs> like, you know, they need to feel welcomed and like, you know, we want you to be here. And yeah. we're so happy to have you and we want you to, to connect with people and make friends. And then we can talk about the bigger mm. uh, possibilities of, you know, what, what we, in working here, we, we can do together as an organization and you as an individual. So I think, um, you know, there's a bit of a rethinking of what the right way to run on board a person is, particularly if they're digital. So you need now a more consistent stream of information going to that person, that kind of contact um because you can't just leave it up to them <laughs> to like no. one person in the hallway right and then yeah but it also yeah go ahead no oh, no i was just gonna say it does then go back to the need for perhaps simplifying and making the whole experience far more individual and personal so it could just be starting with the conversation on and then bringing them in and then recognizing the whole person and why they decided to change jobs and so it's again it's not start big it's like let's just start small and grow from there yeah so, yeah so there's, a, there's good the principles remain the same that says that you know you would find a new joiner is more likely to stay and be more productive if you kind of ask them to connect their um, their personal unique strengths, you know, the things that are very unique about them to what they can bring to the organization. So you just ask them to write down yeah. in a series of conversations, what, you know, what is it that you uniquely bring to this job that you really want, uh, you know, this company to make use of? And, you know, those people then start to think about why am I special here and how can I contribute? Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, you know, I think increasingly, as I said earlier, companies are using better data to figure out whether or not they're getting this right. And so, you know, the moments that matter, which are mm. the you know, these sort of critical inflection points, usually emotionally driven, um, you know, can be measured. And I think the, the rise of continuous listening tools uh, are, have, have helped a lot uh, for the HR function and for line managers but also then sort of the opportunities to combine that with other data. Um, you know, many of us have access to things like workplace analytics tools that analyze our email and calendars and sort of figure out who we're connecting with. So we've got mm. much data streams that we can leverage to better yeah. manage these sorts of things. I think that's a really great segue into the um, other critical point we wanted to point out in terms of um, embedding um, employee 
experience, you know, might need a little bit of an internal branding um, because the it's certainly established that whilst the HR function feel it's highly prioritised and very fundamental, particularly in this environment, the um, acceptance around the value in which it brings, the return on investment, and you touched upon this, um, Lewis. So, Kat, I know you've, you've been working with some linkage analysis around this in terms of what metrics um, employee experience can actually um, t churn out, um, relating back to productivity, in fact. Yeah, that's right. And then also taking it a step further to link to other things such as the customer experience. Because how great would it be if you could map out what a great customer experience looks like and how that relates to profit or whatever it is that measure is that's important to you and then map it back to see what kind of employees, what do they value, the employees who create this value for customers. And so starting to map between the customer experience and the employee experience, and exactly to a point Lewis made at the beginning, it's about finding what those levers are. So mm. now that you've used your data to understand what this employee experience could look like from an ideal perspective, because we know it's going to drive these positive outcomes in terms of productivity and customer experience, how do you then use those levers at those moments that matter to improve that experience, to create employees where they are really giving what they want to be giving to the organisation? So I think it's about taking it a bit of a step further once you've married it up to say what are then the levers that we need to be pulling to create what we want to be seeing in the organisation. I think that's a really great point. And that's already starting to differentiate between the Big Bang engagement survey, which gives you a huge amount of data, very in depth, um, but then leaves the organization with a huge amount of work that has, has to be done to bring it to life. And then, you know, by the time it's actually embedded, it can very well, you know, have been quite outdated. Whereas the continuous listening and, you know, triggered at key points that matter can actually measure the immediacy. And so it feeds um, the organization and leaders back with you know, very current information so they know exactly how to address the levers and, and monitor any change. Um, That's right, yeah. And it also helps with, if you have limited resources, it helps you prioritize where you're going to put that energy or that money. Because there's no point in doing a blanket solution for everyone if at the end of the day, there are a certain type of people who are just not going to care about it as much as another group of people. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, going back to the very first point I made, you know, absolutely, we have to move away from one size fits all. Yeah. You know, that picture itself shows a multitude of reactions and responses at the moment. Um, it actually now t brings us quite nicely into maybe answering some of the questions that have come through. Um, one particular question I'm seeing here is uh, coming from Margaret. Thank you, Margaret. How do we change the behaviours of leaders who still want to return to rules and on-site attendance? There are still many leaders who don't trust employees who work from home. So, guys, what do you think? How about it? I mean, I love this question. I think it's a very important one because um, I've seen two things right now which I find very interesting. This, with the first is, ooh, this is a fantastic opportunity to save money. Do we need all this office space? It's like, uh, and then, you know, so that, you know, someone's got this like cost saving. And then the second is, is that, but hold on, how, how will I know if everyone's working? So actually, did I, did I tell you this friend of mine said to me, you know, um, their, their favourite quote about the pandemic has been, well, I need to go back to the office. H how will I pretend to be working? Like, you know, <laughs> if I need to be physically present so someone thinks I'm doing something. I, I think that's wonderful. So, I mean, I think this is an important point. So there are two segments to this, answering this question. So the first is just straight up a problem about trust. Now, I have a bunch of pre presentations on trust, actually. I should, maybe we should share those. But the, mm. um, I think it's, a, it's the currency of relationships. It, Right, you know, actually, money in in and of itself is a substitute for trust. It's a scalable mm. way of transitioning trust between different uh, entities and individuals. So, I think it's a wonderful way of um, sort of starting with, you know, human communities are powered by it. And if there is no trust, then it's very difficult to get anything done. And so, yeah, that's right. Everything else will break down. <laughs> I would argue 
most, uh, and someone said this to me, and I agree with it, that most of the work that we do in engagement experience in leadership is really about trust, getting mm. people to trust each other. And uh, I think that's a very meaningful set of ideas. Um, so they're, they're, that's one segment to this, like start there. Why don't they trust employees? What is the problem there? And trust has very, uh, is scientifically very well researched and validated and has lots of tangible outcomes. So if you want to know more about that, we have good ideas and material on that. The second thing is, well, so how can then we make a business case for, you know, uh, a new way of working that doesn't involve everyone getting off their ass, commuting an hour or two, sitting mm. down in an office and wasting their time going back in just for the purpose of showing up. And I think that's, a mean, that's an important question because then you have to decide, well, what is the future of work? I mean, the future of work has been a it's been sort of an intellectual exercise that many of us have been mm. going through uh, as a kind of excuse to ignore today's work problems. It's like, let's think about the future so I don't have to do anything mm. now. And so, but, you know, as I've been saying here folks in Singapore, the future of work is now. Here it is. Fix it. And I think, therefore, we need good, better data about productivity, about experience, about what people want uh, from their work. You know, sure, put, go and use the traditional model, put everyone back in the office, maybe it'll work for a bit. But if all of your competitors are moving to a much more flexible model where people find it easier to integrate their lifestyle and their work, you'll lose out on great talent. That's one thing. Second is actually maybe it'll actually be more productive. They will perform better than you. Mm. And so, you know, I think it starts, it's time for HR to, to really pull that people analytic, that analytics lever and start to produce real insight. You've got, this is a huge opportunity. Everyone did something different. Go find out what worked. So that's yeah, I... you're right. It, it's actually tied into another question that's come through as you were responding that um, not everyone's sort of on their way in terms of measuring the right outputs. And but productivity, particularly now we're working from home, is quite a critical one. And you've hit the nail on the head, Lewis, in terms of, you know, we have been HR people have been uh, collecting data, but has it been the right ones? Have you been measuring the right outputs? Yeah. Uh, you know, and maybe now it's around, you know, deep diving into the engagement data, because I know a lot of people are still measuring engagement, but uh, very few people are actually using the data in the way it's intended, or perhaps not really squeezing the um, linkages uh, that you can actually make from the data you're already collecting. Yeah, and I like, I mean, I think um, Natalie has a very important point here, which is, you know, we talk sometimes, and I have a habit of doing this too, we talk about productivity and performance as if we know what they are. It's like, it's like because you're so like, cool, oh, sure, because that's what a business conversation sounds like. But then when you get into it, it's like, explain what that is. And you find that it's like a, you know, the, the uh, I think at the individual level, it means one thing. At the team level, it means a different thing. At the mm. organization level, it means a different thing. And that's where the money is made. And some jobs have clearer definitions than others. Sales is much clearer than some other parts of the business. What is a productive R&D function, right? And then, because that's very difficult because innovative people don't do well under time like, dead, like deadlines and targets. It's, you know, this, again, the science shows that creativity just and innovation doesn't work that way. So then you're kind of starting to vary a bit. But I would say that, you know, most organizations still use some version of performance management that includes what my boss thinks of me is basically my performance and that has again a, a lot of opportunity for people doing stuff that don't work so you know um i think there are i think we in, we should strive to try to be more objective without over, overcooking it like i said you know how much how many emails did you send a day would not be a product useful productivity metric but what would it tell you about the strength of your relationships with others and who you're connected to and what and also like calendar data you know there's good data that shows that if you book a meeting and then have an hour free to answer an email and then meeting and after an hour free because you wind down after a meeting like this you'll go get a cup of tea or something and then sit down then you start planning for your next call 15 minutes before you join it there's no you, and then you spend ages sort of deciding what email you're going to answer. So you answer two emails and actually that hour between calls is not very productive. So there are yeah. ways 
to think creatively about data we have to try to think about are we actually helping people be productive in the way that they experience their work? I think it also lends itself to a really great opportunity to have discussions around, you know, in our team, the way we do our work, you know, what are the outputs that we're working towards? Are our goals aligned to our roles and how we then measured and going back to our points around, you know, what works for one team is unlikely to work for another. So it, again, it's the, the need to segment and to tailor. So another version that it's not a one size fits all. So those global measures of, um, you know, productivity may actually not apply to sales, finance, you know, HR, um, you know, operations, because they're all, we're all doing different things. So again, it speaks to, you know, understanding the workforce from their perspective. So it also lends itself to an employee driven opportunity, um, you know, and making that a possibility around let's all get together and actually have a conversation around, you know, what we work on and how we measure, how we are then measured. Yeah, I mean, the other thing just to say is that, you know, we've seen a rise in um, new ways of organizing like Agile, which I think are interesting in that they tend to think very differently about how to manage performance and sort of much more team-based working. And, what, and there's a, if anybody's interested, there's a chap called Jeff Gothelf, his name is. He used to work in a circus. So it's a very interesting guy. But he has a couple of great YouTube videos, which you can watch them for free, about how um, agile teams actually work and how you task them and how you know they're doing a good job and what kind of objectives you should give them, which I found very instructive because, you know, it's a, you know it, it gave us a different way of sort of thinking about so how do we help organize a group of people who's doing something complex and keep track of whether or not they're doing a good job? Actually, Agile is a very transparent, iterative, fast-paced way of working, holds everyone in the team accountable very effectively, by, but socially. So we have to tell each other every day what we are doing. And you know, the team, therefore, manages accountability. Because if you haven't done your thing, you have to stand up in front of everybody and explain. Mm. That creates a lot of, so I, I think we underutilize the social aspects of, you know, holding people accountable in favor of, well, I've set the objectives in the workday, so done. You know, I think, well, you know, I, think yeah. <laughs> I think that also begs the question around um, is the sort of the values or the culture in which the whole environment um, they, that they operate. So, um, I'm just conscious of time here. Um, we have two minutes left and um, we made a promise to, to answer a couple of questions. So perhaps we'll get back to, to everyone um, after, the, after the session. But in terms of closing, um, I'd, I'd love for each of you to you know, offer what are some sort of last messages um, in terms of engaging with uh, this topic and, and taking it back to the workplace, you know, whether it's your home or uh, an actual physical office, but actually what, what are some messages around getting this kick-started? Cash? I think my takeaways would be find what moments matter to your employees, find out what is working well and what could be working better, and that gives you a starting point to changing the employee experience. Great. Lewis? Uh, I think it's, um, what would I say my like, really big takeaway is like, future of work is now. Like, you know, my, my, the, I think we've been talking about all of this stuff for ages. Like, now is the time to make it happen. You know, we have a level playing field. I like that someone was mentioning there and uh, gives us an opportunity to say, well, we must do it differently. And so I think this is a great opportunity to you know, get the organization, its leadership, and frankly, the HR function in general to try to do some stuff different, you know, investing in some technology that makes sense, but then recognizing that the individual employees themselves have a significant responsibility for their own experience at work. And that might mean taking a bigger interest in their core skills, you know, do they have the adaptability, the self-management, the critical thinking required uh, to, to you know, be a success? And, you know, investing more in that area, I think is, is prudent by now. And, and um, 
Absolutely, I agree with both of you. And I would like to um, reinforce the point around, um, it's absolutely about listening. Uh, listening to employees, listening to the managers who might be struggling with uh, managing a, a virtual team. But starting with the listening, whether it's through a survey, focus group, or one-on-one, -on -one, um, it's also about the human resources other leaders recognizing it's not a solution I'm going to put on to others, but it's actually about asking the, you know, the people I want to provide a solution for what they think. So the solution comes from them. Um, so this hour has gone really quickly. Thank you to you both. I believe we have um, some additional resources um, to share out for um, anyone who wants to follow up. I know um, our participants have been really interested in some of the uh, articles that have been mentioned. So we'll, we'll get back to people with um, those links. Um, but I also wanted to raise that there's a, a webinar next week um, in relation to launching our When Women Thrive report. Um, but in the meantime, thank you again, both Cash and Lewis. Uh, this has been a really enjoyable hour. Thanks, Mary. Well done, May. Thank you for uh, all your effort moderating this. It's, it's not a little bit of work to do this. <laughs> I appreciate it. So thank you very much. No worries, thank you.